introduce our next speaker. His name is Tom Duggan. Tom Duggan is a former member of the Lawrence School Committee. God bless him. And the, a former political director for Mass Citizens for Marriage. He has been a reporter and columnist for the Massachusetts News, the North Andover Citizen, Rumbo Newspaper, and the Lawrence News. He has also been a talk show host and producer for various radio stations, such as, are you ready? 96.9 FM Talk, WEZE Family 590, WROL, WTTT, WHAV in Haverhill, and WCCM in Lawrence. Tom Duggan is currently the publisher and owner of the Valley Patriot newspaper and has been a talk show host on WCAP in Lowell for the last eight years. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Tom Duggan and his newspaper is they're one of the few newspaper outlets doing any type of investigative reporting in our general area. He has done extensive investigative reporting on the mayor of Lawrence, Willie Lantigua, and is currently doing much investigation into the shenanigans um, of Essex County Sheriff Frank Cousins. My friend, Tom Duggan. I want to thank, uh, before we start, I want to thank Christine. It took a lot of hard work, and I actually saw it behind the scenes because I know Christine. Uh, some of the work that she and the Franklin Center, Eric and Tracy, they all did a, tr a tremendous job to get a group of people together who are somewhat like-minded but not the same, um, to come and to listen to the various speakers about what's most important to us. So can we give a round of applause to them because they really did. <laughs> I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, I know Christine says I have an hour, and um, maybe after 10 minutes, she'll be throwing popcorn at me, telling me to stop. But um, as Christine said, I, you know, I've worked in, I've worked in uh, newspapers. I've worked for radio stations. Um, I've actually uh, done some work at some TV stations, which uh, Christine didn't list. And thank you for not doing that. Uh, we don't want to give them any credit at all. Um, but also, you know, not just my experience as somebody in the media. I actually started out as somebody who was being covered by the media. Uh, I first ran for office when I was 18 years old. And the joke was, uh, the, in 1985, I was a high school senior, there was a fist fight at a Lawrence School Committee meeting among, among two school board members. And my mom was a school nurse, so she used to drag me to the meetings because she was always interested in the nurse's budget and whether or not her job was going to be cut the next year. And so I was actually at the meeting where that happened the front page of the local paper the next day uh, wrote a story about it, and underneath that story there was another story about how with the changing of the Lawrence Charter, there were only three people running for six jobs on the Lawrence School Committee. So I decided as a joke, myself and some of my high school friends, that I was gonna run for school committee and my slogan was, Tom Duggan, he'll bring maturity to the school board. <laughs> which I thought would get a big laugh and I'd get my name in the paper and then I'd just move on with my life. Well, here we are some 30-something years later. And what happened was I ended up losing that first election as an 18-year-old. Uh, there, there ended up being about nine people in the race. I ended up losing by about 18 votes. And thank God that I did because I think had I won, I would have gone down the path many of our elected officials have today. Being so young, it would have been very easy when the mayor came over and put his arm around me and said, gee, Tom, I know your mom's a school nurse. How'd she like to be the head of the school nurses? She's all you gonna do is vote this certain way for me. And that kind of stuff happened all the time, but it wasn't until later on when I ran again and lost and then started managing campaigns that I actually started to notice some of that stuff that was going on. So I, as a member of the Lawrence School Committee, uh, eventually I did get elected and it was, very painfully obvious, living in a community where we were a one newspaper town, that the Eagle Tribune controlled the way people think about those in the news that they cover. If they like you, it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to paint you as a hero. If they don't like you, it doesn't matter if you save a baby from a burning building. My joke is they'll reverse the negative on the picture and say, Duggan puts baby in burning building. <laughs> And that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but surprisingly not a, a lot of an exaggeration. And so, sitting on the Lawrence School Committee for three years, 
Uh, one of the things that I noticed was that not just did they have favorites among people on the committee, they also had favorite topics. They also had a favorite agenda. Uh, I remember one of my first meetings I called for the firing of 18 bilingual teachers who were in violation of their um, job description because they couldn't speak English. And the job description clearly stated that they had to be fluent in English and Spanish. And of course, if you're going to be in Lawrence and you're going to be on the Lawrence School Committee and you're going to make such an outrageous proposal in such a liberal bastion of Massachusetts, uh, you ought to know that you have just declared war on every single bilingual parent advisory group, every bilingual teachers union, every news media outlet in the state that has an agenda and a stake in promoting things like bilingual education. Eventually, we got rid of bilingual education, thank God. But what I, what I really was stunned by as somebody who was being covered by the media was that we would sit at a meeting and we would spend an hour talking about having a, an after school program and getting a state grant or a federal grant for four or five million dollars for an after school program for kids whose parents were maybe uh, mentally or physically disabled. And we would discuss this and it would be a heated debate and at the end uh, we would accept the four million or five million dollar grant. But after the meeting there'd be a little tussle on the side, there'd be a little verbal argument among the mayor and a school board member and I'd pick up the Eagle Tribune the next day, and there would not be one word of mention about the great program that we just sat down and negotiated to have for kids whose parents are disabled and can't take care of them after school. The headline was about the tussle that happened after the meeting, the verbal argument that happened after the meeting, and of course, the person that they liked was always the bad guy. Um, the person that they liked was always the good guy, and the person that they disliked was always the bad guy. I'm also the son of a slain police officer. And I, I try to work this into my speeches because it, it, it's something that is apart from politics, but not really. As the son of a slain police officer, as the son of a police officer in Lawrence who was killed in the line of duty by a Latino, the media immediately started with, this must be racism. Just imagine that's you, and it's not just some guy on TV, that it's your dad or your brother or your sister. And I remember picking up the phone and calling the Globe and calling Jerry D'Amico at Channel 7, who's no longer with Channel 7, and saying, why, why are you guys making this a racial issue? Even the Latinos in Lawrence, who are related to the people who murdered my dad, aren't making this a Latino versus white issue. In fact, well, we saw videotapes of my dad's funeral. There were more Latinos in my dad's funeral procession who were just regular people who decided to join the funeral procession because that's what a great relationship my dad had with the Latino community in Lawrence. And yet the Globe and Channel 7 and a number of the local stations immediately went to, that's racism. Because it was a white cop and it were, was Latino so-called perpetrators. They wouldn't even call them perpetrators at the time. And throughout the entire trial, almost every single media story focused on race, and it didn't really focus on the criminal background of the people who committed the murder, it didn't really focus on what those people were doing prior to the murder, and it didn't focus on the details of the man who took a baseball bat to another man's head more than a dozen times. They don't care. They don't have a stake in that. So I come to you today to speak because, uh, partially because as a guy who was in the media, being the person who is covered by the media has shaped the way I do media and the way we do the Valley Patriot and the way I do my show on WCAP, which is a little bit more loose because it's more of my personality and less news. It's more opinion than news. So I've been the guy who was covered by the media and I've been the guy who's been in the media covering other people. I've also been a guy who has done radio production and some TV production and seen how reporters and editors interact with each other and how reporters really get their marching orders from editors, sometimes not specifically by them saying, I want you to go out and screw this guy over, but just by letting the reporters know that I, as an editor, don't like that guy. The reporters know what they have to do to get in their boss's good graces. What they have to do is they have to go out and scare up something negative about that guy that the editor says that they don't like. So we started the, um, the Valley Patriot in 2004, 
And one of the reasons, actually the reason, as we covered in our 100th, uh, 100th edition this past March, was because after I'd left the Lawrence School Committee, I started writing for a newspaper called Rumbo. It was a bilingual newspaper that printed in English and in Spanish. So I wrote in English, and they would translate it into Spanish, which I thought was brilliant. Because most of the immigrants that come here think that Republicans are evil white racists who want to you know, put them all on a boat and send them somewhere to a dungeon. So I had an opportunity, a really unique opportunity, to interact with the Latino community in Lawrence through the translations of my columns and the emails that would come in from Latinos in Spanish I would give to my editor who would translate it into English for me so I could understand what they were saying. But after I left Rumbo, uh, apparently some of my confidential sources didn't realize that I was no longer with the paper and I went out to the news, I went out to the uh, mailbox one day and there was a packet about this thick. And when I started going through the packet, what I found was that the superintendent in Lawrence, his name was Alfredo Leboy, and four members of the Lawrence School Committee were going out to a very upscale restaurant called One Mill Street after school board meetings. And they were eating duck and steak and lobster and they were ordering alcohol and they were having a grand old time for themselves. Also within that packet was the Lawrence School Department credit card receipts where they were billing you the taxpayers. So I called my good friend Orion Johnson who worked at the time, now he's with the Herald, but at the time he was working for the, for the, um, for the Lawrence Eagle Tribune. And I said, look, I know that the Tribune hates me. I know that your bosses hate me. So don't tell them you got it from me, but I'm not with Rumbo anymore. How can I meet with you to get you these documents? Long story short, I met with him and I gave him the documents. He went through them and he was beyond stunned that not only was the school superintendent taking school board members out and ordering alcohol and lobster and steak and duck on your dime, but the four school board members that he was taking out were the members of the finance committee who were supposed to approve the bills on your behalf. So I waited a week and I kept going out to buy the Eagle Tribune, which I don't encourage anyone to ever do. <laughs> and I kept looking for the story and finally I called him and said, look, what's the, I mean, you have all the information. My source who sent me this stuff did all the homework for you. What are you waiting for? His answer to this day continues to stun me. He said to me, Tom, they're not doing the story. They like Wilfredo LeBoy. They think Wilfredo LeBoy is doing a great job. And Wilfredo LeBoy is their best source of information in the city of Lawrence. So I sat down with a couple of friends and said, you know, if we're going to be in one newspaper town, and that one newspaper is going to shape the opinions of the people in the Merrimack Valley, and they're going to determine the way they cover things, whether you think of somebody as good or bad, then what the Lawrence area needs is another newspaper. And so we sat down and we went through every single newspaper we could find, every single newspaper we could get our hands on, and we started circling things that we liked and crossing things out that we didn't, and we were thinking that maybe we were gonna use this as a template to build our own paper. But after a week of doing that, what we really decided was that if we were gonna do this right, we should clear all these newspapers off the table and forget what we like or don't like about them and just not do any of that. So we started our own paper and we didn't model it after any other paper. We kind of made it up as we were going along. And our very first story in March of 2004 was Fine Dining on the Taxpayer's Dime, where we actually printed the receipts of the lobster and the steak and the duck. And I can tell you to this day, I can tell you to this day, people of the Tribune, if they're honest with you, if you ask them, they will tell you that that was the single biggest mistake that they've ever made in their hundred years publishing a newspaper. Because now, they have the Valley Patriot to deal with and we are stealing all of their advertisers, uh, stealing is such a harsh word, we're, we're, we're taking all of their, I am stealing them, we're stealing all of their advertisers and most of our sources are former Tribune sources and Many, many of the stories that we write, we write because we get word that somebody called the Tribune, told them I've got a great story for you, and the Tribune said we're not interested. So they call us. And the great part about owning this newspaper over the last eight years is that now, after doing this for eight years, they're starting to call us first. Because they know if it doesn't fit with the media narrative of who's good and who's bad, if it doesn't fit with what they've already predetermined they want you to believe, 
they're either not going to write the story, or they're going to write the story and they're going to pervert the story. Let me ask you guys a question. I usually do this when I speak to Tea Party meetings, but I think it's, I think it's uh, kind of a fun way to remember this. What do you, what's the first thing you guys think of when I say the words Dan Quayle? Just shout it out. Anybody? Christine, am I wrong? I could go to Alaska and ask that question and get the same answer. And the reason I ask that question is because it's a perfect example of how the media, I don't want to use the word brainwash, because brainwash denotes the idea that you're not in control of what you're saying. But it is part of the media propaganda. The media, and those who work especially in print and TV media, understand that what they do is to put mental images into your mind. Based on how they describe something, you get a different mental picture in your mind. So when you say Dan Quayle, and everybody thinks potato right away, that's the result of the constant drumbeat, day after day, month after month, for the four years of the bush Quail administration, of the, of the liberal, mostly liberal, news media, trying to make sure that Dan Quayle was not going to succeed George Bush as the president because he was the vice president next in line. Was Dan Quayle an idiot? I don't believe that for a minute. The guy never could have become a senator. He never would have been a very successful businessman. And he certainly wouldn't have been chosen to be vice president of the United States, although Joe Biden calls that into question. <laughs> well, that's true. I stand corrected. The news media and the people who run the news media go to journalism school. I can tell you right now that if you have a journalism degree and you're under the age of 40, and you call the Valley Patriot looking for a job, we're not interested. We're not interested because today what they're calling journalism is really National Enquirer propaganda. What they're teaching people is journalistic ethics, not ethics. See, the Valley Patriot, we're concerned with ethics. We would never, ever, ever print a story about somebody's sex life unless it had something very, very seriously close to do with the job that they're doing. I don't care that Newt Gingrich cheated on his wife. I don't care that Gary Hart was cheating on his wife. I don't care that Bonnie Frank is gay. I don't care, and neither should you. What we should care about is the job that they're going to do. So what we tried to do with the Valley Patriot is present the facts and a perspective on those facts, but also keeping in mind that we don't have the monopoly on truth that my perspective on gay marriage, and my perspective on abortion, and my perspective on taxes, might be very different from every single person in this room. So if you want to write a story for the Valley Patriot, and I don't care if you want to write a story that completely eviscerates my last editorial, not only will we publish it, but we'll do something that most newspapers won't do. We'll publish it word for word. We'll move commas around, we'll change spelling, but what we're not going to do is pull out a paragraph for length, supposedly for length. What we'll do is we'll call you and say, um, Helen, this is 2,100 words. Can you cut 100 words for us so that she's the one who decides what content comes out as the writer, as the guest contributor, or even if, as a staff writer? What, what we've seen in the last, um, I'd say maybe 20 years, going all the way back, I'd say to Richard Jewell, Remember Richard Jewell? Everybody knows, knows who he is? He was the guy that was accused of being the Olympic bomber, and this goes back to the propaganda. I flip on TV one day after the Olympic bombing in, um, I think it was Atlanta, Georgia, and the news media was reporting that the FBI had arrested the Olympic bomber. And we know his name is Richard Jewell because the FBI went into his basement and they found duct tape and steel shavings, which, which can be used to make a bomb. How many of us here don't have duct tape and steel shavings in our basement? But they presented the story as if these facts equal a conclusion, and then they tell you what that conclusion is. That duct tape plus steel shavings in a basement equals bomb. Until those of us who think for ourselves say, wait a minute, I have duct tape and steel shavings. I also remember um, something else I uh, bring up here is that pri very prior to 9-11, the news media was absolutely obsessed with Gary Condit. Gary Condit was the congressman whose, um, whose aide, Chandra Levy, disappeared. And we know he had to have done it because there's racy emails. And we know he must be guilty because they had an affair. 
Well, there was rumors that he'd had an affair. Well, somebody said they had an affair. So he must have done it. And even the Greta Van Sesterns of the world, and even the Fox Newses of the world, which is better than the other news medias, but quite frankly, if you don't mind me being crass, they suck too. They only look good to us, those of us who are conservatives, because they're better than all the others. But quite frankly, when I put on Shepard Smith and I see the first two stories about Lindsay Lohan and Charlie Sheen, I say the news media, including Fox News, has sold us out. The bottom line is, Lindsay Lohan is not news. Gary Condit's salacious, rumored affair with his aide who happens to be missing, and we don't know what happened to her, is not news. Someone being accused of something is not news. Trayvon Martin is the latest example. We were told at the very beginning by the news media that Trayvon Martin was the innocent victim of an evil white racist. Wasn't that interesting? Because when I looked at the guy and I started reading about Mr. Zimmerman, it turns out that he was neither evil nor white nor racist, or maybe he is racist, I don't know. But isn't it interesting that when a Latino, according to the news media, when a Latino is supposedly targeted by a white police officer in a traffic stop, he is treated as though he is minority slash black. But when the victim of a beating, or the supposed victim of a beating, is darker skinned, and the supposed perpetrator of that beating is a lighter skinned but Latino, the Latino is considered Latino slash white. That's by design. The news media completely understands how to put mental images into your head and they're very, very good at it. Because even for the first month I was walking around thinking, you know, this, this, this Trayvon Martin kid, I mean, you know, maybe he was a punk but he didn't deserve to die, isn't that awful? Well, just this week we find out through Mr. Zimmerman, some of Mr. Zimmerman's testimony and, and interviews, that really the evidence is starting to show that it was Trayvon Martin who committed the first act of violence, even though he was carrying Skittles, <laughs> right? He must be innocent because he was carrying Skittles, right? Now these are all the silly, ridiculous things that the media does to put mental images into your head. That this poor young boy, and by the way, I don't know if any of you know this, but the picture that the media, the news media, including Fox News, was showing on TV of this poor innocent Trayvon Martin for the first three to six months of this scandal was a picture that was at least four years old showing a young, innocent, wide-eyed, faced boy. I've now come to learn that there are pictures of him shortly before he died at six feet, I think one inches tall. And he wasn't really looking at all like he was a young kid, a small kid that was being picked on. Um, I'm probably going to make some people angry, maybe even all of you angry with this one, but I just kind of try to call it like it is. Um, the news media has been on this Elizabeth Warren thing, I think, for a long time. And when it first hit, my first thought was, once again, this is not news. Whether Elizabeth Warren claimed to be an Indian or she didn't is not news. What's news is that the Boston Globe covered it. That's the news. Because you know if it was a Republican, they would have covered it the first day, distorted it, put mental images into your head, Scott Brown equals bat. Scott Brown equals liar. The real shocking thing is that the Boston Globe is now covering Elizabeth Warren and painting one of their own as a liar. Now, I'm not sure why they're doing this. I'm just happy they're doing it. But to me, the only thing that makes this news is that the Boston Globe broke from form. And they actually decided to do their job for once, for whatever their reason, even if their reason was nefarious. Let's at least give them credit for doing the right thing, even if it was for the wrong motives. There's three types of media bias. The first is laziness. We see this with most of our local news. You pick up any of your local daily papers and most of the stories that you read are going to be recycled AP stories, stuff that they pulled offline, or the easy story of a car crash or a fire where they you know, stand on the side of the road, they take a few pictures, they go back and they write the who, what, where, and when. But what they're not doing is investigative journalism. 
I'm going to give you a great example. And we're going to get to the media law stuff in a second, but if Christine, if you give me like a 15 minute like warning, so I can, um, let's see where I want to see that. Oh, media bias. So there's laziness where they just don't want to do any work. They don't want to do an investigation. It's a lot easier to write a story or rewrite a press release that they get from a nonprofit than it is to go out and actually do investigations. So one of the things we started doing at the Valley Patriot from day one was doing investigations. The other, part of, the other uh, kind of media bias, which I think is, is probably the worst, is corruption. We think of corruption, and we usually think of elected officials. We think of people who own major corporations. We think of candidates for office being bought by special interest groups. What we don't think of is the corruption within the media themselves. Let me give you another great example of the Eagle Tribune, which used to be called the Lawrence Eagle Tribune, but now they're just the Eagle Tribune. Uh, last year, we published a story called Sober House on Crack Corner. Essex County Sheriff Frank Cousins decided that, in his infinite wisdom, that he was going to put a sober house for people recovering from heroin and cocaine addiction on Oxford and Lowell Street in Lawrence, where there are more where there was more heroin and more cocaine being peddled on that one block alone than in most communities you live in. We wrote the story, the Eagle Tribune ignored it, Channel 7 ignored it, Channel 5 ignored it, Fox 25 News ignored it, WB ignored it, everyone ignored the story. So we decided we were gonna do more investigations into Sheriff Cousins because A, he's a Republican, and even though I'm a Republican, it's always good to show our readers that we're not ideologically based. We're not going after Mayor Willie Lantigua and Lawrence because he's a Democrat, or because he's a Dominican, or because he has dark skin. We're going after him because he's corrupt. And what better way to prove that than to go after one of our own, which I actually think we have more of a responsibility to do. Because I expect more from a Republican, and I expect more of somebody who claims to be fiscally responsible, and moreover, being the son of a slain cop, I expect way more out of somebody involved in law enforcement than what we're seeing in the Sheriff's Department now. So we started doing another investigation and what we found was that there was an escape from what they call the farm in Lawrence. The farm is a minimum security, it's kind of like a dorm room. Um, they have the freedom to kind of come and go as they please as long as they stay on property. And what was happening was it's supposed to be for minimum security prisoners, but what we're finding out is that people who are not really eligible to be minimum security people with very violent pasts are, um, well, try and do this without getting myself in trouble, are, um, through political favors, finding their way to the farm. We'll put it that way. Try and keep myself out of court again, <laughs> which we're getting to. So we had this guy, I think his name was Whalen. He walked away from the farm. He had 46 prior violent felonies, including sexual assault, including assault on a police officer, multiple restraining orders, and we posted it on Facebook, we posted it on the Valley Patriot website because we're a monthly paper and the paper wasn't coming out for a couple of more weeks. I found out through a friend of mine who's a state representative that if somebody walks away, if somebody escapes from the custody of a sheriff in Massachusetts, it is state law that they, involve, that they notify the public. So you know who's walking through your neighborhood. If you live near that facility, you want to know that somebody has escaped. So if you've got kids or elderly grandparents, you can kind of keep an eye on them and make sure that the people walking through your neighborhood don't look like this guy. The Sheriff's Department caught him a week later in a crack house. They arrested him. He went to court. The judge ordered him to be turned back over to the Essex County Sheriff's Department, who housed him in Middleton's maximum security for less than 24 hours and returned him to the farm, whereby he summarily walked away again. I won't bore you with the details of the third escape, but they caught this guy and he escaped a third time. And we wrote about each escape, and we talked about how this guy was continually escaping because the people in the administration at the Sheriff's Department weren't looking at his jacket, which, someone was, uh, which a confidential source was nice enough to share with me, which said, escape risk, all over the top of every page. <laughs> so I started calling out the Eagle Tribune on WCAP, my radio station, uh, it's not my radio station, um, the radio station that, uh, that I do my show on, and I started calling out the Eagle Tribune in my newspaper, 
because the sheriff's department was not only allowing this guy to escape over and over by putting him back at the farm, but they weren't notifying the public. And I thought there were two stories here, the multiple escapes and why that's happening, but also why the Eagle Tribune was not reporting the story. So Gretchen Putnam from the Eagle Tribune says to me, off the records, I know nobody will tell anybody. Gretchen Putnam who works at the Tribune says to me, listen, if they sent us a press release, we'd print it. <laughs> really? So I called a friend of mine, like they're not gonna go out and do the job, they do their own job, right? They want someone to do it for them. So I called a friend of mine in the Essex County Sheriff's Department who was feeding me lots of documents, who has been summarily fired, by the way, for feeding me documents. Um, and he said, Tom, look, we, we at the Sheriff's Department have not been notifying the press. And the person who um, is the press coordinator for Essex County Sheriff, you might want to give him a call and ask him why. Come to find out, the press person for Essex County Sheriff Frank Cousins was a guy named Paul Fleming, who was a former reporter at the Eagle Tribune. And now we know why. Because Sheriff Cousins was so in bed with the Eagle Tribune that he was hiring the reporters to work for him to keep all of the press that was going on to be positive. So on the third escape, our headline was, third escape, I forget the exact title, the exact words, it was something like, Cousins allows third escape, violent felon, um, walks away third time. I pick up the Eagle Tribune the next day, and the headline was, Sheriff Cousins gets his man. <laughs> again. again, well they didn't say again, but they left out of the story, and you can Google it, you can go on the Eagle Tribune website and look at Sheriff Cousins gets his man. They didn't tell you in the story this was his third escape. They didn't tell you that they found him in a crack den twice when they picked him up the, after the first two escapes. They didn't tell anybody um, that the guy had 47 violent felonies in his past, including sexual assault, assault and battery on a police officer, multiple restraining orders. This was a story to make Sheriff Cousins look good. Now that's great. Look, I own a newspaper, it's a private company, nobody can tell me what to write. If I want to write that Christine is the greatest person since sliced bread, that's fine. But I really believe that the media also has an obligation. I don't think the government should ever be telling us what we can and can't write, but we, we certainly have an obligation to tell the truth and not just part of the truth. Because really, the Eagle Tribune headline wasn't a lie. Sheriff Cousins did get his man again for the third time with 47 multiple felonies. They just didn't tell you the whole story because they want the mental picture in your mind come election time, Sheriff Cousins equals good. Just like Gary Condit equals bad. Just like Tom Duggan equals bad. Just like Barack Obama equals good. They're counting on your knee-jerk visceral reaction so that you don't have to think when you hear certain things. Mother Teresa. We all think happy thoughts right away. We don't even have to think about it. Adolf Hitler. We all think negative things. Well, most of us think negative things. Without even thinking about it. And that's what, they, and that's what the ply and trade is of, of the, especially the local media, but certainly the national media. So how does all this work in with, uh, with what I was asked to speak with today? I know it's a pretty big buildup, but, you know, my, jo my, job, is, my job is to, um, is to present the facts. The Eagle Tribune, Channel 5, Fox News, their job is to present the facts. But when there are laws in the way to stop people from presenting the facts, and only certain people from presenting the facts, what ends up happening is you have a news media that can either get in bed with the politicians to get the favors so they can get the stories from the people on the inside who have a stake in you writing their side of the story. Or you have members of the news media who are completely shut out because those people won't talk to you because you won't present their side of the story. Look, let me tell you one thing as a newsman that I really love is that's when I'm wrong. Now, I know you're all gonna roll your eyes and go, come on, give me a break. Seriously, if I get something wrong, whether I'm on the radio or in my newspaper and somebody says, hey, you know what, that's not right, I don't care that I look like a buffoon because most people think I'm a buffoon anyway, so it doesn't really matter to me. What does matter is that by the end of what I'm doing, people have the correct information, so I appreciate those of you who corrected me on that. The other thing that, that I wanted to tell you a very quick story on is the libel laws. And this is something that is going to affect every single one of you, whether you're going to be a blogger, whether you want to write a column for a local paper, whether you're on the radio. A couple of years ago, I'm involved in a lawsuit right now, 
uh, by a couple of lawyers who decided that they were going to try and bankrupt us by lawsuit. Now, they've failed so far, but they came pretty close a few times. What happened was there was, a, um, there was a couple of attorneys working for the city of Lawrence. They were doing workers' compensation law, and we had gotten word that one of the people who worked in City Hall was about to be fired, got tipped off by somebody in the law department that they were about to be fired, so that day, they went in and filed for permanent disability, claiming they could never, ever work again because Lawrence Mayor Mike Sullivan yelled at them and hurt their feelings. <laughs> Which actually did happen. And, so, and her name is Andrea. So Andrea um, was the assistant to the DPW director, and by the way, the girlfriend of the DPW director at the same time. And we had also heard that, that the law firm that was representing the city in workers' compensation cases, which would handle her disability claim, was very good friends with her and her husband. And in fact, I myself had seen her husband outside City Hall chatting with these lawyers, these two lawyers whose office is next door to City Hall, by the way. And so I'm watching this so-called conflict of interest, possible conflict of interest, and I got a phone call one day from someone in City Hall who said, that, the, that Andrea had won her case against the city and that she could never work again ever because she was yelled at and was having anxiety attacks because the mayor yelled at her and hurt her feelings. At the same time, she was applying for jobs in Haverhill at the highway department, which was absolutely stunning to me, but this is Massachusetts and that's how our courts work. So I got a call from a, a guy who worked in the mayor's office who said to me that, um, that the city had fired the law firm that they no longer were going to represent the city on workers' compensation cases. And I had actually gotten word from one of the lawyers himself who told my girlfriend at the time that they'd had this serious conflict of interest, that they were worried that it was going to come out. So when I learned that they got fired, that the city got rid of them because the city believed that they threw the case because of their closeness with the people on the other side of the case, I went on WCAP and I reported that on the radio that the ex-law firm, I won't say what it is, because we're involved in the lawsuit, but that the ex-law firm was fired by the city of Lawrence because Lawrence Mayor Mike Sullivan's administration believes they threw the Andrea Traficante case. I got a phone call three days later, I was in, I was in, um, I was in uh, Disney, and I got a phone call from the lawyers that I reported on. And he not only told me, but actually sent me in writing an email saying, I'm not interested in suing you. I don't think you did anything wrong but I want to know who your sources are. I want to know, and, and I think his exact words were, I want to know who dimed us out. So multiple phone calls go back and forth between myself and this law firm, uh, the Diadem law firm. And, um, yeah, well, they're already suing me anyway. What are they gonna do, right? So Mr. Diadimo calls me and he says, I don't, I don't have a, any beef against you. But here's what's going to happen, Mr. Duggan, if you don't tell me who your sources are, because we want to enact what we're going to call Diadimo justice. We want to know who badmouthed the Diadimo law firm. We want to know who your sources are. And here's how it's going to work, Mr. Duggan. And by the way, he was 100% right. He said, if you don't tell me who your sources are, I'm going to sue you and the radio station and your newspaper. And I'm going to get you under a deposition. And in a deposition, you have to answer all my questions. And I'm going to ask you in a deposition who your sources were. At that point, you have two choices. You can tell me who your sources are, or you can go to jail. We'll march across the street, we'll stand before a judge, he will hold you in contempt, and you will sit in jail until one of two things happens. Either you tell me who your sources are, or they come forward themselves. Well, we tried an anti-slap lawsuit because we're part of the media. We lost. We appealed it. We lost. We appealed again. State Supreme Court. We lost. So now the lawsuit moves forward and I am called down to a deposition where I know I'm going to have to give my sources. And this is the life, this is the lifeblood of true free media, is to be able to have an anonymous source that can tell you about the shenanigans going on by either government officials or people sucking off the trough of government and not have to worry about retaliation or what he called diatomal justice. So I called my five sources the night, before my, the night before my deposition, and I explained to them that if they didn't want me to reveal their name, I wouldn't, and I was perfectly happy to go to jail. I wasn't really happy about it, but, but I was prepared to go to jail if they didn't want me to reveal 
But I also told them what would happen once I went to jail. Either they were going to have to come forward, or I was going to have to give their name, or I would be in jail in, in per perpetuity. Thankfully, all five of my sources, former mayor's aide, actually another former mayor's aide, the mayor of an adjoining community, and a few other people who worked in City Hall, said to me, yes, you can use our name. We don't want you to go to jail. We appreciate that you've spent 40 something thousand dollars to fight this lawsuit to stop from revealing our name, but we don't want you to go to jail so you can use our name. So I had to go in to a deposition and sit with these two very unpleasant men who knew the law way better than I did and spent tons and tons of money to do it. And I had to reveal to them who on the public dole that they had been working with, who had been colleagues with them, had in their eyes dimed them out. Yes, Christine. Oh, that's my that's my fifteen minutes. Oh no, not fifteen. Ten? Oh no, I gave you ten like ten ago. Oh, I'm sorry. So we're, you're wrapping you're wrapping me up. Is that it? Because Massachusetts doesn't have a shield law like New York does. Anybody in this room who blogs, who writes a letter to the editor, who writes a column, who writes an article, whether it's online, goes on the radio. If you reveal news and the person that you're reporting on wants to know where that information came from so they can retaliate in some way, whether it's physical violence or trying to take their job away from them or some other way, you have to give up your source or you're going to go to jail. Because in Massachusetts, we don't have a shield law. Even if what you wrote was the truth and not violence. Even though what you wrote was the truth. Now, what I wrote was that this law firm had been fired by the mayor's office. True. That the mayor's office believed that these guys threw a case. True. But I still had to give my sources because they're lawyers and they know the loopholes and we don't. Or I didn't. I've certainly come to find out now that we really have no rights as journalists in Massachusetts. And I can just tell you real quickly, I wrote a story two years earlier, three years earlier, about leaking toxic chemicals at the water treatment plant in Lawrence. And the guy who sent me the pictures with his cell phone of these big barrels, if you go to my Facebook page, they're still up, of these big barrels of white phosphorus foam coming out of it with footprints through the white foam that was on the floor with these big signs that say caution, toxic materials. The guy who sent me the pictures sent me the pictures on his last day as a city worker working in the water treatment plant because he was afraid of retaliation. Because he knew something at that time that I didn't know, which was if he dined out his bosses at the water treatment plant and his DPW director, and they wanted to find out who it was, all they had to do was drag me into court and force me to do it. So he waited till his very last day at the job to take the pictures and send them to us, which was a great story. We actually, I think we won an award for that. Um, but think about the fact that this guy for four years worked around this stuff for fear that if he told anybody, they would retaliate, maybe take his job or do worse. Just imagine if we had a shield law in Massachusetts whereby he could have sent me those photos the day that they started illegally storing the mercury and the toxic chemicals at that water treatment plant that we all just paid for. Yes? You know, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Maybe I'll. Maybe that's something to, something to look up. Um, I would. I would imagine, just guessing off the top of my head, I would imagine that if the if the tort or if the supposed tort occurred in Massachusetts, even if you were based somewhere else, in other words, if my office was in New Hampshire but I was distributing in Mass, and the people that I wrote about was in Mass, I think Mass law would probably cover that. But don't quote me. Yeah, but then they want to know who you verified it with, and that's what happened. So we can protect you if you want to be an anonymous source, but what I had to do is I had to go into court and I had to prove that I had that I had, had two or three sources that I confirmed this information with. In other words, it wasn't just some guy that didn't like the Diadema law firm calling me and telling me a story that I just ran with, but, you know, with no information. I called a, a mayor of an adjoining community to confirm it. I called somebody in the legal department that didn't work for the Diademos to confirm it. I had two people who worked directly in the mayor's office who were involved in the firing uh, or the non-renewal of contract, whatever the legal term is. Um, 
But I, but I, I actually have to go in, and this lawsuit is still pending, I had to go in and I had to show that I did my due diligence. And even though I did, even though what I reported was true, even though I verified that it was true, even though that I did my due diligence, even though they were fired, and even though the mayor at the time did believe, and I think still believes, that he threw the case, the judges wouldn't throw it up. And I'm still facing multi-million dollars, multi-millions of dollars of losses, which I think at the end will prevail. But if you don't have the kind of money built up in your savings account to pay for lawyers to fight these lawsuits, they can take everything you own. And that's the price of free speech. So I want to leave you with, if, if you're looking for something to do, if you're looking for a cause to help in Massachusetts, we need to be fighting for a shield law. Thank you.